community banks should understand that they, they have a they have an hiring advantage that I don't think that they necessarily capitalize on. There's folks out there that would love the opportunity to roll up their sleeves and move an organization forward in a very meaningful way. And I think for some reason, we don't always tell that story well, or we don't even pursue that talent thinking, well, they'll never come work here. And I think that's, that's a huge mess. Welcome to the Operate Podcast, where we give you a behind the scenes look at company building from the perspective of the builders themselves. This is how we operate. Welcome to the Operate Podcast. I'm Kerry Ransom. Today's episode is sponsored by Bank Tech Ventures, the first strategic investment fund designed by the community banking industry for community bank innovation and investment. Bank Tech identifies leading products and technologies for community banks and works with the founders and management teams to maximize the impact for community banks and their businesses. If you're a bank looking to innovate and invest in the future of your bank or a founder who wants to work with community banks, reach out to Bank Tech Ventures at banktechventures.com. My guest today is Sean Willett, who is Chief Administrative Officer at Five Star Bank, a multi-billion dollar community bank based in upstate New York. Sean leads corporate strategy, innovation, technology, and several other things, but we're going to have a ton of fun talking about those topics. He's been in the financial technology and financial services industry for 25 years, having also been at Pfizer, JP Morgan, and Morgan Stanley during that time. Part of why I love Sean is he's super thoughtful about the future of banking, including the challenges that incumbent banks have in adapting and transforming to the changes in front of them, and also recognizing the opportunities that they have. And as such, we'll talk about how he came over to a community bank from some of the bigger incumbents that he was previously with. He's super passionate about technology, but also customers and competing to win and serve them well. And I think it's that combination that I just so appreciate. Sean, I'm super happy and excited to have this conversation. Thanks for joining. Thanks for having me, Carrie. Really, really appreciate it. Absolutely. So it's been probably two years now that we've known each other. And I just always enjoy the conversations, the collaborations, and even sort of challenging each other that that we often have. Uh, I'm curious though. I mean, you're you're a banker. Why do you indulge me and frankly other entrepreneurs when we bug you about banking and and innovation around it? Well, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for. A tough question on a you know <laughs> four o'clock on a Friday on, on the East Coast after a long week. So I I think simply put um, for at least for me is I I really enjoy learning and mm. hearing what's happening. Right, one of the key challenges for the industry is we act in in, in operate in in a, in a very siloed way. Right, so if you have the blinders on, you kind of miss the forest for the trees. And so for me, it's really about what's happening and is there an opportunity for us to better serve our customers? You know, the way that I think about technology and innovation, especially relative to the bank and the customers is, is it going to help us, you know, either acquire or retain customers? Is it going to create some level of efficiency or is it going to unlock new revenue opportunities for us? And so I think to, to do that, you have to really understand what's out there versus what you're typically spoon fed from, you know, incumbent third parties that you're already working with. You know, I certainly saw that when I took over the technology at, uh, operation at, at Five Star a couple of years ago is we really had just two partnerships, two technology partnerships. One was new, which was our digital banking platform. And then the, the other was, you know, we've been with our core provider forever and my predecessors tend to rely on the latter I think that's that's a missed opportunity. I don't want to say it's a mistake. Um, I do think some you know core providers have some some good ideas, but it's incumbent on you as a banker to figure out what's the best way to serve your customer and what's the what's the best mousetrap out there, right? So, and actually, I just I really enjoy the, the conversations, right? So you know whether it's with you or others, um, mm -hmm. I do benefit from this relationship from the standpoint of just what's out there, what um, Bank Tech Ventures is looking at. You know, I think what's really great about the BTV relationship is the fact that you really want that feedback. I think you genuinely are interested in other people's perspective. So having an opportunity to kick the tires on a potential partner 
and, or just hear what's happening in the marketplace. I think is, I think is the best way for us to be informed. I really appreciate it, and my my team appreciates it. I know you know I try to hire curious people. It's it's benefited us so far, so it's, it's worked out. Yeah, and I want to talk about the talent topic later for sure because I, I think that's a big, a big one. Um, so you had two relationships when you joined. How many now? Oof, um, much more greater than two for sure. Sure. Um, at any given time, I mean, I would say that we probably have you know a dozen very active mm -hmm. um, relationships, and then probably upwards of two dozen conversations that are occurring mm -hmm. at any given time. Um, in really just driven by those types of, you know, in introductions or alternatively people hear about what we're doing. Um, and so we do get some inbounds. And so we, you know, we entertain those inbounds. Um, you know, I don't think, I personally don't think of myself as the smartest person in the room by any stretch. You know, what I say about myself is that I'm clever and I can connect dots, mm -hmm. you know, hearing other, you know, what other people are doing and why they think there's a value proposition to customers. I think is important, right? And I think it's important to bankers to be open to those ideas, which I'm not sure that all of us are, right? And I think that's why we're some of us are in in different positions grappling with the the current landscape is, and I think it's almost a wonderment to say what what should I be doing, but they don't necessarily know how to go about the the what, right? And sure. I think the what for us is really those conversations. That's that's super valuable. And I think great perspective that you're probably not going to be able to operate a modern bank with only a couple outside right. vendors. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's become a much more complicated business, particularly as it becomes totally digital. Yes. Yeah. I agree hundred percent. I think it's also an element of risk management, right? So it's allowing right. you to hedge risk, right? That's right. Um, so, you know, spread the risk accordingly, let people do what they do best. Mm -hmm. whether it's people on your team or alternatively your partners. Yeah, great perspective. Okay, so we're two-thirds, I guess, three-quarters of the way into the year now. Uh, it's been a wild year in banking. Just curious, doing a pulse check, how are you feeling particularly about community banks and community banking right now, given uh, the year that we've had? So, yeah, so I guess I could potentially would have answered that question differently back in March. Exactly. Versus today. Personally, I'm I'm optimistic. I'm realistic, but I'm but I'm optimistic. I think that you know we as a financial institution, you know, in conjunction with our board, our management team, you know, recognize the challenges on the landscape, and as such, have, have you know, taken the the you know requisite steps, midterm or short term, I should say. But recognize that you know the strategy that we're employing um, to a great degree should help future proof us on a go forward basis. So, mm -hmm. you know, strategic, you know, through throughout the course of this year, there's been many conversations on how to respond to the market. I don't want to say it's a it's a survive. Uh, you know, I don't think that we were ever we certainly weren't at risk. We didn't see an outflow. Um, mm -hmm. you know, we were very proactive in in customer conversations across all the lines of business, um, fielded questions from consumers about what was happening, you know, with SVB and, and others, and, you know, would there be a knockdown effect on the bank? And so we took those steps. And then we looked, we thoughtfully looked at our strategy and said, okay, given the, given the marketplace and the challenges, the funding challenges, you know, pressure on NIM, et cetera, what mm -hmm. are we doing? It does it make sense and made some adjustments, but you know, what we've laid out is a very thoughtful strategic plan. Um, we go through an annual exercise, as you know, with our board of directors to, to look at our strategy and make adjustments. Those ideas are stress tested by the board, um, mm -hmm. I think, in a very thoughtful and productive way. And so we never lost sight of we, we established a big, hairy, audacious goal for for the organization. And we were remaining true to that course, but we're making some adjustments. Right. We know that we need to get better at deposit acquisition. That's not a five star challenge that's an everybody challenge mm -hmm. um you know cornerstone published something i think that was really interesting earlier this year um that 47 percent of checking accounts opened right were opened by non-bank and fintechs right and so we look at it as okay we can fight for the 53 percent with everybody else including the big four and 
credit unions and other community banks, or alternatively, we can have a strategy that allows us to go after the 100%. Mm-hmm. And so that's where we look at banking as a service, very complementary to the franchise, helping us bring in you know, lower cost effective deposits and then being able to deploy that into relationship lending, allowing us to stay in the game when others are not, right? Mm-hmm. As we know, um, we're seeing the credit tightening and we're, you know, we're able to continue to stay in the game and serve clients and, and acquire new clients. So that's really encouraging and that's how we're able to explain how banking as a service is complementary to our roots as, as a community bank. Um, but yes, I mean, I'm, I'm optimistic. I, you know, I, you know, I know what some of the things that we're working on and it'll make it better for our customers in footprint and beyond. So, um, but, you know, mindful of, of what's happening. Um, I think the federal reserve has a tough, tough challenge, right. To navigate a soft landing um, against the backdrop couple of strikes, uh, you know, with Kaiser Permanente out on, you know, out on the West Coast and the UAW. Um, and then, you know, obviously the turmoil in, in Congress, I suspect that, or in the House, I should say. And I suspect that there will be a government shutdown at some point. So I think it's, you know, we need to be mindful of all that and course correct where appropriate. Yeah, it's so, such a good foundation. I can go in a bunch of different directions Yeah, from here. I mean, one thing I just... In the in the course of banking, I think your process, that strategic plan, annual uh, revisiting, I'm curious your perspective there as you think about just all the things you just said, like the pace of disruption change seems much more frequent than annual these days. Um, have you guys made any changes midstream because of what's happened this year to your strategic plan? Do you think those planning and execution cycles should be shorter? How, how are you thinking about that in the face of of all the the craziness that we're we're living in? Yeah, um, so there's a lot to unpack there for sure. Um, so I should I I feel like I should pull out a piece of paper to keep up with you, Gary. <laughs> um, so I wouldn't say that there would there would be at least at this point there's been no major course correction, mm-hmm. right? So that's one. Two, you know, we constantly review all of our lines of business Mm -hmm. to ensure one, it's it's in line with our risk appetite, but two, is it in line with you know the financial targets that we put in place, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the majority of of the bank looks at it from the standpoint of if it doesn't make sense, then we you know we shouldn't keep throwing good money after bad, right? And so I think everybody's open to that. I don't think anybody takes any one line of business personal um, in that regard. Second, while we have a three-year strategic plan, the reality is it's it's, it's an annual update. Mm-hmm. And then there's within the course of the year itself, we do, you know, we're actively checking in on, you know, our strategy. Um, but, you know, one of the key takeaways for this year to your point about frequency is really looking and saying, okay, what is a, what is our value proposition to the customers that we want to serve or clients that we want to serve. And then how do we stop doing the things that are just okay to good and focus on the things that we want to be great at? Mm-hmm. You know, as we, as we were discussing earlier, you know, we try to be all things to all people or all customers, right? And I think in, in some ways that's that's just the genesis of, of you know, banks, right? That's right. Uh, you know, Particularly that, community uh, banks. Yes, like I, you know, I feel like I have to serve everybody. And I think that's where, fintechs um, and non-bank financials have an advantage, right? Because they have a value proposition to a very specific customer. And that is magnified around customer acquisition, right? I mean, that they do a great job Mm -hmm. attracting those customers to their value proposition. And I think we need to look at it the same way. Um, We're not there yet um, by any means, but I think that as an industry, that's the way that we should be thinking about it because it allows you to shed a lot of that legacy weight. And by weight, I mean, just like tech debt, and, you know, um, physical spaces that we're operating in, et cetera. And then it allows you to repurpose your people into doing what they do best and meeting the needs of the customer, but maybe a much more hyper-segmented um, version of that customer, right? But you would you would argue that the value is far greater in that regard. That's right. 
Well, and I think one of the things that earlier this year highlighted, let's and let's, let's particularly focus on the commercial side of of banking, is you had some banks that had massive amounts of deposit concentration and uninsured deposits, obviously, but their customers were very comfortable for a variety of reasons and just having all of their money in a single bank. And I think that is probably forever changed. And then you add to that this interest rate environment and people are saying, not only do I have to have a risk management of deposits being spread across institutions, but I probably also want to get an equivalent yield that I haven't had to think about for a long time. So in that vein, how are you, how do you think about, we want to serve a hyper-segmented customer base, do it better than anybody else. Also recognizing that they're probably not going to have all of their money with us ever. Um, and we want to you know, do what we do. Great. How, how do you, in your mind, reconcile some of that to say, hey, we, we still can play this very strategic role, but what, what, what may that look like? <laughs> so, and, and I'm laughing just because again, it's like, this is, um, this is a, 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 you know, a uh, thought exercise for sure. Um, so I, I think there's a couple of ways to answer that one. I think going back to, you know, the, the comfort of having all of your, your eggs in one basket in, until they weren't comfortable. Right. That's right. Um, and I think that what happened in the marketplace, you know, in particular with Silicon Valley bank, um, you know, was probably unique circumstances, um, for sure. For sure. But, but to your point, look, pe people engage with us as banks because they trust us. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that we always capitalize on that trust relationship. And what I mean by that is, is that if you, if somebody trusts you, you really should be providing that, that value add feedback to them, right? So you may not have the best product or solution that they're looking for, especially if we think about cash management or treasury management services, you know, that typically is not an area of strength for most small community banks or smaller community banks. But if you have the right tools, you're, and you're certainly aware of what the, the customer client is trying to do, you can direct them to a partnership or an alternative that you may not necessarily generate immediate revenue from, but I think you've strengthened the relationship more so with, you know, with the customer. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, and I think that's a great example, right. In terms of, you know, just doing that, that treasury management, you know, treasury mm -hmm. liquidity services as an example. Right. Um, so having a partnership with somebody else who can provide that outlet, you're the single plane of glass into the, the customer and, and what their needs are. And then being able to convey that as, as a two-way pane of glass for the, the CFO of a, of a commercial customer, I think is it, there's immense value there. Um, totally. And I think we're fearful to do that because we fear that if we introduce somebody new into the equation, somehow that's going to disintermediate the relationship. But the reality is, is that, you know, if we look at what's, you know, small business in particular, or even just SMEs, small to mid-size enterprises, that's happening already. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're allowing somebody to capture a payments relationship, you know, just through accounts payable or accounts receivable, you know, if we look at Square, if we look at Amazon, we look at PayPal, et cetera, what is the first thing they do? They capture the payments relationship and then it's an immediate swarming of, of that particular SME with traditional banking products and services. And you've sure. been completely disintermediated from the equation instead of having an, an ability to control um, that payments relationship. So kind of where I see banking going, and this is just one guy's opinion, is that the banks that survive will be the banks that can quarterback that relationship, whether through their own products and services or through third-party relationships with financial technology firms or otherwise. Well, it start, I mean, I think back to your point, you start with trust. And if I trust you, and I know it's not just about you selling me whatever you have it's how do you how, if i trust you to help me solve my biggest problems because to your point it's not single product needs right. that the customer has they're gonna their their complexity is increasing as far as financial tools and financial services so if you can be the the provider of 
the greatest visibility and, and data around that, then you can probably help me construct the best solution set. The bank is certainly going to participate in some part of it, probably at least the part you do best. So, yeah, yeah it's great. In, I think in the, in the back of my mind somewhere, um, you know, we had at, at a prior, at a prior institution, you know, our core values to, you know, two of the four, you know, one was putting the client first, right. And the second was leading with exceptional ideas. And I think if you do those two things, you, you, you deepen the relationship, you deepen that trust. Um, and I think the banks that do that well, typically win. And if somebody leaves because they're rate chasers or some, you know, for some reason that is, you know, what, what I would consider commoditized, that's probably not a client long term that you, you know, that you really want to work with, right? I think that they might have been looking at at you because you provided cheap access to your balance sheet, um, or mm -hmm. for some other reason, and then you know if they're moving because they can get twenty five basis points elsewhere. That's that's not a value laden relationship in my mind. Yeah. One of the other things that I really appreciated when we first met, Sean, was, you know, how you and Five Star were very open to consider early new ideas, right? New York was one of the early states to approve legalizing cannabis. And then because of that, banking, those kinds of businesses became an opportunity. Also, um, you guys, I know, took some early interest in crypto. So, it's great ideas. It's been very challenging with the regulators. So I'm just curious from that, you know, it's that it's easy to just maybe step out, get hit hard and then never want to do it again. But yet I know that's not going to deter you guys. So I'm just curious what you've learned from that and how you think it will impact other new ideas or, or earlier ideas. Crypto um, was was definitely an eye opener, and it, it was an interesting experience. And, and to be clear, um, just for the listeners, we had an early partnership with with Nidig, mm -hmm. and I think they had a really unique consumer solution. Right? I think that at the end of the day, if I was looking at you know across spectrum of risk of crypto, that was probably the safest. Um, sure. The challenge is always you know working with the regulators to get them to understand what it is that you're trying to do and why. Right? Mm -hmm. And you know, crypto for us was was less about the unit economics, right? I don't think there was no great, you know, there wouldn't be a, a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow there. Sure. Um, but but what it does, I think, is signals to a desirable market, right? For us, how do we attract an eighteen to thirty nine year old to bank with us, right? Sure. And so we looked at that as a potential, you know, flag that we could plant and say, hey, look. You know, this this bank whose predecessors date back to 1817 is as forward thinking as any fintech that you mm -hmm. might be dealing with in the crypto space. And, you know, so it was a great opportunity for us. And unfortunately, we never got it past friends and family, um, really because of, of the, you know, just the the regulatory hurdles, if you will. But and, and it'd be clear, like, I don't want to make this as like, a pull, you know, basically beating up on the regulators. I think we have a really good, work, you know, working relationship mm -hmm. with our regulators. We appreciate, obviously, right. everything that they're doing for the financial system and the safety and soundness. On the cannabis side, I think, as you rightfully point out, is, is you know, very similar, although the regulatory appetite is much different. You know, for us, we're a state chartered bank in New York. And New York is, is you know, increasingly becoming a cannabis friendly state. Um, we have a really unique program from the standpoint of the licensing, you know, license structure, 50% of the licensees are social justice, social equity. And so, again, if I think about one of the you know, main missions of a community bank, it's to, you know, serve the underserved in our communities, right. right? And so for us, you know, that was, you know, that's appealing. Um, and then second, you know, early mover status on an industry that today, and, and I think it will become less so over time is cash rich, right? Mm -hmm. So, if, you know, again, if we can capture relationships with um, the, you know, whether it's, you know, the businesses on the, on the grow side or all the way through cultivation, processing to retail uh, distribution, it's an opportunity for us to acquire and retain deposits. And we look at these as small businesses whose business just happens to be cannabis, right? Yep. 
Yep. And so again, community banks do a really great job at serving small businesses in their community. And this is really no different other than the fact that um, it's considered a schedule one narcotic by the federal government, which mm -hmm. presents challenges. But as far as I know, um, as long as you stay within the FinCEN guidance, no financial institution has been penalized for banking cannabis. And then certainly it's on a state-by-state -state basis what the requirements are. And so we looked at that as an opportunity for us to, to take what we do well from a banking perspective. And we have a strong BSA ML function. We made investment in, in regulatory technology. And, and we, you know, basically, again, had conversations with the state. The state obviously is encouraging its banks sure. to properly bank its businesses for obvious reasons. And so we, you know, we felt like this was, you know, a, another area that we could place a bet, a reasonable bet. Um, and, you know, do well as a result of it. And, you know, New York state just this week, um, opened up licensing to, you know, what I would classify as general, right. They've moved from so the social licensees now into a broader set of licensees. So you're starting to see activity momentum is growing. And so we feel as an early mover, we can capitalize on that. Mm -hmm. But again, staying true to our knitting as a community bank, right. Mm -hmm. You don't, we don't look at these businesses any differently other than the fact they're, they're considered, you know, they are high risk and we've taken the appropriate steps across people process technology to support that business. Great perspective. Really, really appreciate it. I think that will help a lot of people understand a little better. And I, mean, I think the final thing is, as you sort of intimated, is just in that case, you're providing the kind of financial safety and soundness to an industry that has had to do, in many cases, unnatural things outside of the banking industry just to to continue to grow and support itself. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, it's just 75% of cannabis businesses are banked, right? But what they're missing out on is essential banking services. And they are mm -hmm. so desperate for those services, right? And so they're so appreciative when you, you're able to provide solutions to their needs, to your point. I mean, it's outrageous in terms of some of the, you know, what they're yep. charged, on, you know, credit and the like. And the majority of these operators are very capable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they typically have run other businesses. I, we look at it as a very durable relationship as a result, right? They know the lift that's required, but because there's that appreciation, there's that trust, the likelihood that they're going to take off if you know if you do right by them is is pretty low. Yep. Um, but kind of going back to, I just wanted to just capstone this um with something you you know critic you know like i get criticism internally and externally especially on the crypto side like i think somebody had a wonderment in the office like whose whose dumb idea was this right right in front of me they had no idea it was me mm -hmm. said, well, mine. if you know if you're not willing to take you know chances and i, I look at it as prudent risk yep you're just you're never going to grow you're not going to learn you know and i have three kids and i tell them all the time the, the best uh teacher is failure right Mm -hmm. uh, if you're not willing to <clears throat> put yourself out there to fail, you're never going to learn anything. That's right. Well, and it's, I mean, it's that whole portfolio approach, right? I mean, I, I talk to far too many lenders, as an example, who say, I underwrite to zero loss. And you kind of say, well, I get it, but I'm pretty sure even if you underwrite to that, you're going to probably have some. So maybe it's more appropriate to say, what's an acceptable loss? Right. We don't want to put the whole institution at risk on one loan or one one idea but you have to take a portfolio approach and i think increasingly in this era of rapid change partly why i was challenging on the the strategic plan revision timing is i think you have to and again you're not going to ever walk into an initiative going i know this is going to fail that's why we're doing it but you just you have to take a, a, a portfolio approach to say Hey, we it, the ones that are going to succeed are going to far outweigh the ones that maybe don't do as well, and and we have to revisit and cut things that that aren't and move on. Yeah, I, I, and I totally agree. I think if if you're not willing to take, I mean, banking in of itself is taking risk, right? That's right. It's not no risk. It's risk right. management. That's right. Exactly. And, and that's but. But I think there's that mindset now that I'm I'm better off if I hunker or if I turtle. But we know how that's going to play. Yeah, it might be great for the short term, but long term, you're you're toast. That's right. You know, from my viewpoint. Well, and that's a risk, right? As as one of my partners says, doing nothing is a choice. And right. 
it is a you know if you if you choose to do that that is a risk management decision as well i think yeah but i think that in, to to that point i think it's an existential you you're taking an existential risk in that regard that's yeah. right well as i mentioned earlier you know you left uh, some bigger financial institutions to ultimately join a community bank. Um, I, you know, I have the reasons why I've gotten into doing what I'm doing now to work with community banks, and I have such a heart for it. I'm curious what really attracted you to to make that jump um, to a smaller, more nimble institution. Yeah, so that's that's a great question. I'd, I'd like to say that you know I had some epiphany along the way while I was at Morgan Stanley. It was it was really driven for personal reasons. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, I'm native to Western New York. When when I left, you know, um, I didn't at any point think that I was going to be back. Quite honestly, and um, my my wife had moved back a year prior. I was commuting every week. I was on a Monday 5 a.m. flight, Thursday mm -hmm. night flight home. You know, and that gets old, right? And, mm -hmm. and I had three, three young kids and. You know, I was an absentee father, and that 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 certainly weighs on you. So it was it would, and it was just by, I don't want to say luck, um, that I was introduced to um, the management team at Five Star, in particular, our CEO Marty, and had a conversation with them. And Marty, if you get to know him, is uh, you know he's, he's a great salesman. He's a commercial sales. He's a commercial <laughs> banker by trade, mm -hmm. right? So he's a great salesperson, right? And the way that he talks about the bank is that we're a 200 year old startup, right? Mm -hmm. And or th that's the, the mindset, right? That he wants to curate. And you hear that and it sounds, look, it you know, might sound corny to some, but it, it holds true, right? Is that mm -hmm. you're going to come in and you are, you're going to have control over your own destiny and you are going to affect change. And you know, I would, I've learned invaluable lessons, both at, at JP Morgan and, and Morgan Stanley that continue to serve me well, risk-taking being one of them. And both of those organizations are you know very good at, at risk-taking, but they're also very good at risk management, but they have slip-ups along the way, but it doesn't mm -hmm. preclude them from taking additional risk as they go forward. But, you know, the ability to come in and say, look, I think it, it, obviously we try to be very rational about what it is that we do. And, and I came in and I took over an, an audit function that was a traditional audit function. You know, my view was, well, why aren't we providing value to our internal clients? You know, we should be trusted advisors to the business, identify issues before a regulator does. And then eight months after that, I was, was promoted to, to the chief risk officer, um, took the same approach with, you know, enterprise risk management, rolled that out. And then from there, um, you know, about the same amount of time later, I was promoted to chief administrative officer. So then I started to get a little nervous because I was thinking the next step at nine, eight, nine months after that I was out the door. But, um, <laughs> but that's so far, so good in that regard. Absolutely. But, you know, all along the way, the, the management team and, you know, Marty in particular and the board have been supportive, right? When, you know, we want to embark on something new, we want to try something different. They, they're they supportive, right? We lay out clearly what it is that we want to do, what the objectives are, how we're going to get there, where we're going to make, you know, the, the investments. And we've got to be very thoughtful about where and how we spend money. You know, they're supportive. And, you know, I really enjoy the ability to affect change. You know, my joke was I could step out on a Broadway, get hit by a, an ambulance or a bus or a cab. And before they're putting me in the back of the coroner's van, my replacement's already in a seat. At Morgan or even at JP, right? And so you you are a critical component of the of the bank's success when you come to a 600 person organization. And that's really the story that I've used to attract talent. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's just that, like, hey, you you know, some of the members of my team they they've all come from large organizations. Um, one of our board members joked, or actually the chair of the board joked, that I've established a, an alumni chapter of Morgan Stanley. <laughs> but I've been able to attract people because of that, right? Like mm -hmm. um, I just got a guy who is is running our operations and technology group and he moved to Buffalo in December from Hong Kong. Mm. He moved from the tropics in the middle of winter to Buffalo, New York. He loves it for those reasons, right? I, I think that, you know, 
community banks should understand that they, they have a they have a hiring advantage that I don't think that they necessarily capitalize on, right? There's there's folks out there that would love the opportunity to roll up their sleeves and move an organization forward in a very meaningful way. And I think for some reason, we, we don't always tell that story well. And so therefore, or we don't even pursue that talent thinking, well, they'll never come work here. So therefore, I'm not even gonna bother. And I think that's, that's a huge miss. You know, I look at some of the things that we're doing, um, you know, from the standpoint of investments that we've made, whether it's, you know, API or robotics or AI even, you know, we're doing a lot of things that much larger banks are doing that is really attractive to people you have in-house, right? Mm -hmm. And typically, why do people leave? Well, they, you know, there, there's the adage of leaving because of a manager, but I think probably more appropriately, they're leaving because they don't see a future opportunity to grow, that's right? right? And so again, I think that's a missed opportunity. You, you can be doing some of these really interesting things in a very cost-effective way that would be super attractive to your internal talent. You know, even folks that have been there for 10, 20, 30 years, everybody likes the new challenge. They want to learn. Right. Um, my, my reason for coming is different than, than others, but, but, you know, I have no regrets. It, it's been awesome. You know, we have a pretty diverse footprint, you know, so we have 10,000 square miles of, of physical footprint. Mm -hmm. and, um, there's days I have to be in Rochester, or, you know, Warsaw, New York, where our headquarters is, the majority of my team is. So driving an hour is not, you know, is not a big deal. I don't dread the commute or anything like that. You know, I think for me, it's, it's been fantastic. It's been fantastic for, for my family. They see me. Although my, my, one of my kids did ask when I was going to be going back to New York City. So I don't know how to take that, but. <laughs> <laughs> so much good perspective and advice there, though, that you know, just to your point, like, focus on the strengths that you have, the opportunities that you have. Generation, we we talk inside of, of Bank Tech Ventures at times about how do we help community banks make banking cool again? And a lot of the things that you just highlighted are all elements of that for a new generation to come join or even for that existing to get re-energized. And most of the, the newer technologies while, while people, I think at times get a little fearful in the beginning, most of them end up being enhancements to the job, enhancements to, to us as humans to do more human energizing work. And I think we just have to tell those stories better. And, and I think you guys do that and it naturally attracts people. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree on, you know, hundred percent. I think what you perceive as a weakness can be turned into a strength. I think you just have to have the courage of conviction to do it. And be open to bringing new blood into the organization, right? It, you know, story, personal story. When you know, I went through the interview process. Um, that, you know, met with the executives, and there was a concern by one in particular that I was going to be to New York City, and you know, then told subsequently told me a year later that that wasn't the case, right? That mm -hmm. um, I, I didn't operate in a you know I was going to toss over desks and you know be <laughs> abrasive. A lot of times it's just a matter of, you know, how things are framed, how things are put together, but, but new perspective is, is always helpful. And I also think that that's an area of, of further opportunity for community banks, right? Is that outside perspective, the, the, I think the biggest problem we have is we think only experts can solve the problem, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and I think that's why going back to what we were discussing earlier about fintechs, I think a lot of community bankers are dismissive of fintechs. And I think it's born out of the idea that they look at some of these, you know, fintech founders, uh, you know, they're wearing jeans, they got long hair, they, oh, they're mm -hmm. 25 years old, what are they going to know? But as I point out, it's, those are the folks that are disrupting our industry. It ain't the experts, right? right. And so you got to figure that out and think, again, there might be a better way to do something and be open to the better way to do something. Because if you don't, you know, again, that 47% of checking accounts is going to grow. It's only going to continue to grow. That's right. Well, and and, and I think to your point, I'm taking the time to understand why they're not going there because it's a fintech. They're going there because somewhere they, they're perceiving a better solution to the problem that they have, which may or may not be true. And so understanding that as a competitor, which is part of what I love about you, is you you want to compete. And I think part of it starts with that desire and willingness to say we we can compete here yeah 
let's talk a little bit more. You know, we we've talked about kind of the community banking industry writ large. As you think about organizational structure, right? The fintech versus the bank. Uh, I've been in a couple pretty significant fintechs. I know what our organizational structure looked like. And we had pretty much every banking function inside of our company, but also a lot of functions that you don't typically see inside a traditional community bank. I'm curious, what what do you think about as a model for an organization team talent that the next generation community bank should have? Yes, I mean that's a that's a great question. That's something that you know, I, I, you and I I know have discussed up up until prior to this, you know, mm. getting on the, on this uh, this podcast, right? Um, I th- I think the biggest yet one I think it, you know, we need to be more agile, right? Mm. Um, and if we think about the the world today is the slowest that the world will be. That's right. Right on a go forward basis. I mean, we just think about the acceleration um, that's coming. You know, AI driven, et cetera. Um, and so, we operate in weeks and months, in years, and that's not the way that the world is operating anymore. And so, I think we one need to recognize that. And two, I think the biggest challenge, as we've discussed, is there's there's a significant level of tech and process debt, right? Um, you know, we're constantly looking at how can we be faster, more efficient, more effective, right? Um, whether it's the, you know, the way the processes are engineered, like a process, you know, we went through an exercise of documenting our processes as an organization. And, you know, you, you look at a process and you say, okay, well, in reality, this process should be, could be three steps, but we make it five, five six, seven, right? Um, and it's all for you know historical legacy reasons, right? That probably are not germane to today's operating environment. And you know, most of us just take that for granted. And then mm-hmm. our teams are taxed, right? And then they'll say, well, we don't have capacity. And then the knee-jerk reaction is, well, I, we need to bring on more people, right? And so you're bring you're throwing people at bad process, and you're compounding, you know that kind of monolithic structure versus mm-hmm. saying, okay, how do we be more agile, et cetera? So I think one, we need to be more agile. Two, there's there's a plethora of things that we probably do today that we don't need to do as we've discussed, right? I think there are things that we could strip away. Um, we could rely on outside partners to do those things. Kind of going back to that quarterback concept, I think that works for clients, but I think it also works for how your infrastructure operates, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm really quarterbacking solutions that come in and make processes more effective, more efficient. Automation, you know, the holy grail for us is straight through processing. And that really is born out of, you know, a sales and trading environment, right? Mm-hmm. Being quicker, better, faster, obviously makes you more money, but it also takes away a lot of the operational risk. And so that's what we're working towards. You know, I would say that having an, an organization organization that again has some core competencies i think there are certain things that you, you have to own as a, sure. as a financial institution right for sure risk and compliance you know being a key area but there's also better ways to do risk and compliance as we know right through regulatory mm-hmm. technology that a lot of us are reticent to to onboard right or we don't believe that that's efficient as the tried and true paper you know methodology um i heard in an example an internal example of how we were disassembling a digital process to make it a manual process because we believe that it, that would create a better client experience. Now, I don't get really high or low. And so people that listen to this podcast, I apologize. My range of emotion is pretty limited unless you are <laughs> my children. But that was like, you know, an apoplectic moment where <laughs> my head's ready to explode when I hear that because that to me is just foolhardy. For a whole host of reasons, because if you do that, one, I think you're you're missing the boat or missing the mark relative to what a customer experience should be, mm-hmm. and second, you're going to compound the need to continue to add bodies to facilitate okay. this process because now all you've done is taken your higher paid resources and made them entry, you know, mm-hmm. admins, right? They're mm-hmm. just you know, data entry folks, and so I don't see the value add there. So 
long way of saying, I, I think that, you know, a FinTech model is probably one extreme, you know, and we've talked about this relative to core environments or core operating systems. They're becoming more modular, right? Mm -hmm. So it allows you as a bank to start to pick and choose. And if we start to think about hyper segmentation of your customers or creating ideal customers, that allows you to pick and choose, which I think starts to reduce the tech debt, which starts to reduce the process debt that comes along with it that allows you to be more nimble and then allows you still to own really the key functions because you have to understand how that ecosystem comes together. And then that allows you to get over the, I think what would be the regulatory concern, right? Like if you're outsourcing all these things, what are you really doing? There's an, there's an evolution, but I think there has to be a very quick evolution for us to, to get there or even revolution for us to get there. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's sort of, no, I think it's great. I mean, I think what one of the things that I'm thinking from that is the type of organizational leader that an environment like that requires is uh, an agile, flexible leader that solves each problem maybe differently. And that, as opposed to, oh, I need to hire somebody for that. Like there, I think there was a history of sort of probably largely the same decision to solve different problems. I think today's leader probably needs that flexibility, agility as well, because some cases it may mean we need to do this or we need to stop doing this or we need to start doing this. And then even how you accomplish it. So I, I wouldn't hire a chief technology officer whose only solution was we're going to write code for this or build this because even as a pure software company, which I would I would argue increasingly banks are becoming, you're still going to buy software to run that business under any circumstance. Yeah, hundred percent. And you kind of what we're talking about here fast, this is not a new idea. Sure. Uh, if you know, I was listening to a, a podcast about Napoleon and Napoleon had this concept for his armies, right? He had what he called cores and what it allowed him to do, each core could operate in a self-contained way, mm -hmm. but it also allowed him, so that allowed him to distribute his force Mm -hmm. But one of his key components of his strategy was he would, he would, at the time, armies would try to stretch out as far as they could, and then they would attack by flank. And what he would do is he would have these cores that could be self-contained, but he would then consolidate all his forces into a single point and mm -hmm. then punch through the lines. And once they broke through the lines, they would just dismantle the, the opposing army. And what's fascinating is like, we know the Waterloo. Mm -hmm. But his losses, you know, in the, the march into Russia, I mean, he was defeated by weather more than anything else in that instance. But his battlefield record was exemplary, mm -hmm. right? From the standpoint, he, he won much more than he lost. But the one time that he assembled a grand army, that was a massive failure. And then at the Battle of Waterloo, he actually abandoned the strategy that was successful for him. But but nonetheless, that whole idea of these, you know, modules that you can pull together to meet the needs of a customer or take advantage of competitive advantage of a situation, in my mind, is what, what we really should drive towards and what we're talking about is that you can kind of snap together what you need, take advantage of a market. If that market dissipates or is no longer, you know, competitive, it allows you to disband quickly and then snap together additional modules. So. Um, in my mind, as, as we're discussing, that is, I think, a true agile organization mm -hmm. that can operate as a regulated FI. Yeah. And I think just that as a capability, too, gives you such a different way to engage with customers. And we know that personalization of financial services and advisory is only going to increase. This is, yeah. it's going to be, again, about the customer, the ones who know and can serve that customer best and most personalized are likely going to be the ones to to win them and keep them. Yeah, uh, and totally agree. And I think in that quarterback concept that I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. right, is the data, right? Controlling That's the right. data, controlling the information. That's right. More importantly, being able to develop insights off of that to take advantage of of a you know a situation or an opportunity. Absolutely. Well, Sean, we're definitely running up against time. This has been so fun as I knew it would be. Um, last few questions. So first, 
as you think about just your own growth on an ongoing basis, you know, what habits or things do you do to just invest in yourself for your own leadership and, and personal development that keeps you going? Conversations like this, exchange of ideas. I love to read, big fan of podcasts. You know, for me, my, my place of sanity is actually sitting on a lawnmower on Saturdays for a couple hours and listening to podcasts and whether they're, you know, business focused, financially, you know, economics or even history and lessons that can be learned there. Mm -hmm. um, I really, you know, and that for me is one, it's relaxing too. I think it's, a, it's, it's a source of opportunity to learn from the past in the case of history and then what could be applicable. As I mentioned, I, you know, I try to be a learner, a life, lifelong learner. Um, so, you know, I've continued whether it's certificates or advanced degrees and then tap into the peers and cohorts that come out of that, right? I think which, mm -hmm. which are fantastic opportunities and tend to be cross-sectional from, from an industry perspective. So what's one thing that most of your banking peers wouldn't know about you? So a lot of people don't know I'm actually a professionally and classically trained French chef when I received a degree from uh, the French Culinary Institute in New York City. Um, I did that at night. That's awesome. Um, I got to stage and work in some really cool restaurants for, with some really, you know, impressive chefs, you know, so that's not something that you know, I necessarily talk about, but <laughs> the application to what we do, you know, being able to work in a heated environment, being able to work quickly, but follow instructions. I mean, if you think about, you know, the way recipes are constructed, something I enjoy. It's something that I don't have a ton of time anymore to do, but it's maybe someday I'll, I'll go back to it. I always, you know, talk about opening up like a roadside barbecue or something like that. Oh, I love it. But yeah, I don't, you know, it's people who know me certainly know. Um, but as, as far as community banking peers and the like, that's not something that, you know, most folks readily know about me. Last question. If a FinTech or a, a business is talking to you and they find out you're at a community bank and they say, you know, why would I want to work with a community bank? How, how do you address that? Uh, you know, maybe it's luck. I, I haven't run into that situation, to be honest with you. I really, I really believe, you know, the majority of fintechs actually prefer to work with smaller organizations. Mm -hmm. The value proposition is, is far greater to a community bank than it is to a super regional or big four. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, likelihood you're going to be able to work with a member of the big four or JP Morgan is, you know, probably, you know, slim. And if you, if you do, it's probably because they have an ulterior motive that they're probably mm -hmm. they're going to make an offer to buy you. And, and so I feel like every conversation we have, there's, you know, there's a two, it's a two way dialogue. I think you're in it for the shared experience and the shared, um, you know, collaboration and benefit. And they view it as, as a learning opportunity to refine their, their product and service. And I'll just say that that's probably a key, key takeaway for community banks, right? We let perfection be the enemy of good mm -hmm. um, versus iterating your way to greatness. You know, we, we do it. Um, I see it every day, right? It's that we're fearful to launch until we think it's perfect. Mm -hmm. By then, typically the opportunity is gone and the space is crowded. So be open to iterating. I think Reed Hoffman summed, summed it up best, right? If you're not ashamed of your first release, you're spending too much time in that, that ideation stage. Yep. Oh, it's great. Great feedback. Well, Sean, thank you. I knew this would be a super fun conversation and it was, I so appreciate you. You're willing to speak your mind. You're willing to lead and, and be a leader in community banking. And I, I appreciate that so much and, and appreciate the partnership. Thank you again for joining and look forward to uh, what's ahead for us. Yeah, likewise. No, thank you. I, I appreciate it. I uh, appreciate our, our friendship and our, our partnership and collaboration. I always learn something every time I talk to you. So it's a win-win all around. So thank you. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Operate Podcast. If you like this conversation, as a favor to me, you can rate us, review us, or subscribe, or tell your friends. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at Operate Podcast. Until next week, get out there and operate.